It is my great pleasure tonight to announce that Dr. Mary Robinson, the first woman president of Ireland and a world-renowned advocate for human rights, will be the AAG's 2012 Atlas Awardee. Mary Robinson truly embodies the ideals and goals of the AG Atlas Award. A staunch supporter of human rights, she's a former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. She currently serves as president of the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice, and Robinson has received numerous honors and awards throughout the world, including recently the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor from President Barack Obama. Mary Robinson became the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in 1997, following her nomination to the post by United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan in the endorsement of the entire General Assembly. She assumed responsibility for the UN Human Rights Program at a time when the Office of the High Commissioner and the Center for Human Rights were consolidated into a single office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. In this role, Dr. Robinson gave priority to implementing the Secretary General's reform proposal to integrate human rights into all of the activities of the United Nations. I think that's very significant. So often human rights, is so, is, is, uh, as with so many other causes, gets pigeonholed into a little office someplace that's only, that's their responsibility. But to make human rights uh, mainstream and to make it an integral part of the United States, as well as I hope uh, what we're trying to do here at the AG is to make human rights integral and mainstream in, in uh, geography, in the, in the way in which we practice geography. And during this first year uh, as High Commissioner, Mary Robinson traveled to Rwanda, South Africa, Colombia, and Cambodia, among other countries. In September of 1998, she visited China, the first High Commissioner to do so, and signed an agreement with the government of China for the UN to undertake wide-ranging technical cooperation programs <clears throat> to improve human rights. Uh, Robinson also strengthened human rights mon monitoring in such conflict areas as Kosovo in the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Mary Robinson also was the first head of state to visit Rwanda in the aftermath of the 1994 genocide there. She was also the first head of, head of state to visit Somalia following the crisis there in 1992 and she received the CARE Human Humanitarian Award in recognition for her efforts in that country. In 2004, she also received Amnesty International's Ambassador of Conscience Award for her work in promoting human rights. Dr. Robinson was educated at Trinity College and at Harvard Law School. As an academic, legislator, and barrister, she sought to use the law as an instrument for social change, arguing landmark cases before the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court in Luxembourg, as well as in the Irish court courts. In recognition of her extraordinary accomplishments in the world of human rights and social justice, we are honored to present to Dr. Mary Robinson the 2012 Atlas Award. Please join me in recognizing and honoring Mary Robinson as AG President Audrey Kobayashi presents her with the 2012 AG Atlas Award. Audrey. The Atlas Award honors an individual who has contributed to what I think of as the spirit of geography in the betterment of the world who, like Atlas, has helped to support and uplift human life. So it is truly an honor to present this award to Mary Robinson, who has shown in Ireland and throughout the world uh, to be, herself to be an inspirational figure, whose dignity, whose common sense, and whose sound principles have evinced the substance of world betterment in human rights, in governments, and in issues from women's rights to the relation between church and state to the importance of the diaspora to the impact of climate change, which she'll speak about uh, tonight. So it was with great delight that I present this award to you
stand up. <laughs> um, first of all, this is a check for $10,000, uh, which is going to the Balina Arts Center in County Mayo to establish an Atlas Award for primary school students to learn about climate change. And County Mayo is the county in which Mary Robinson was born. And this is the award. <laughs> I'm just going to balance it here. <laughs> up the world here. <laughs> Mary Robinson will now present um, her address to the AG on the topic of mapping the future of climate change. Mary? Good evening, and could I just say that I'm delighted to have been invited by the Association of American Geographers, AAG, um, this evening. And in particular, I feel very honored indeed to receive uh, this Atlas Award. Um, I'm also very happy to receive it from another woman president. I believe in women presidents. So thank you very much, Audrey. <laughs> and I'm also very honored and pleased that the previous honoree, the first recipient of this award, was Jane Goodall, um, whom I have met and whom I admire greatly. I've had some fun in her company. She's great fun, um, as you probably saw last, um, two years ago. And she has done, done such important work for endangered species, for fragile ecosystems, and for local communities. I must say, I feel it's no accident that in the 21st century, the first two recipients of this award that's associated with a sort of male physical figure are two women, you know? That a, that's a, has to be a good sign. Um, your association is almost a century old, and it's continuing a great tradition of scientific research and inquiry, which goes back for centuries. Thousands of years ago, ancient geographers, um, such as Ptolemy and Stro Strobo, we're asking questions about the world we live in. Their knowledge of the world was much smaller than what we know today, but their activities were much the same. I don't know if they would have, as I understand you are in this particular meeting, having a particular focus on human rights, which I very much appreciated when I learned that this was part of, um, as has already been said, um, part of your uh, way of capturing the, your work as geographers. The Oxford Dictionary definition describes geography as the study of the physical features of the earth and its atmosphere and of human activity as it affects and is affected by these, including the distribution of populations and resources and political and economic activities. The effects of human activity. Now, that's not something the ancients needed to be too concerned about. The wealth of the world's resources seemed boundless then. Today, we know all too clearly the limits of the world, Earth's wealth and the terrible damage we will cause if we don't take steps, urgent steps, to stop destroying the environment in which we live and which uh, so many take for granted. In approaching the impact of climate change, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of climate justice. That's the issue which is the focus of my foundation, the Mary Robinson Foundation, Climate Justice. And I feel that it's the defining issue of our time. It's an issue which should have particular resonance for the geographer community, given the potential scale of adverse impacts that the planet is facing, and the diffuse and unequal distribution of those impacts. Just as the impacts affect parts of the world differently, 
So are countries responsible for the problem and actions to address it in differing degrees. Addressing these differences in an equitable way is the core of climate justice. Yesterday, I was in Geneva at a meeting organized by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, my former office, looking at the links between climate change and human rights. And I was very interested to see how that debate is maturing and coming closer together. And this gave me great encouragement because I think we are now seeing that climate affects people and we need a human-centered approach. Climate justice links human rights and development to achieve a human-centered approach, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change and its resolution equitably and fairly. Climate justice is informed by science, responds to science, and acknowledges the need for equitable stewardship of the world's resources. It takes a human rights-based approach to combating climate change, which seeks equitable outcomes to both protect the vulnerable and provide them with access to benefits arising from our transition to low carbon development. Climate justice has a focus on people, as I said. It looks at the causes, the impacts, and the solutions to the problem from a human perspective. Climate justice is fully informed by science, but it communicates and identifies solutions from the perspective of human needs and rights. As such, it seeks equity in the way in which we deal with the negative impacts of climate change. For example, which countries take the lead on cutting greenhouse gas emissions? And equity in accessing, assessing, accessing benefits, for example, access to off-grid renewable energy for communities living without access to electricity. In our world today, 1.4 billion people have no access to electricity. 1.4 billion in the 21st century. 2.7 billion people still cook on animal dung, firewood, or coal, and ingest fumes that affect them and the children who are probably standing around as they're cooking. And of course, of that 2.7, the vast majority are women. It might be best in this company if I were to describe my approach to climate justice in terms of geography. I'd like to examine how climate change affects different parts of the world and people differently, how responsibility for the problem is apportioned geographically, and how the geopolitics of climate policy influences decision-making at the international level. First, there's the geography of climate change impacts and vulnerability. When we map the outputs of climate, uh, global climate models, we see that the physical impacts of climate change are not evenly distributed across the globe. As you will all know, low-lying deltas, coasts, coral reefs, mountains, dry lands, and the polar regions are among, amongst the regions to be most affected by the impacts of climate change. We also know that our most populated cities are predominantly on coasts exposed to sea level rise, increased storms and flooding. The world's urban population now exceeds 3.4 billion people, up dramatically from the 260 million in 1900. And this translate to, translates to large numbers of people living in locations vulnerable to climate change. Meanwhile, the challenges for rural areas, while different, are no less dramatic. Whether climate change manifests itself as an extreme event, like a flood or a drought, or a more gradual change in growing season and rainfall patterns, the impacts on rural livelihoods are significant. But physical exposure to climate risks is only one part of the problem. The other aspect is vulnerability. And like exposure to risk, it has a geographical complexion. Put simply, vulnerability is the ability to cope with risk. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change defines it as, and I quote, the degree to which a system is susceptible to and unable to cope with adverse effects of climate change, including climate variability and extremes. Vulnerability is a function of the character, magnitude, and rate of climate change and variation to which a system is exposed, its sensitivity, and its adaptive capacity. That phrase, adaptive capacity, is critical to understanding how people cope with the impacts of climate change. Adaptive capacity is a function of wealth, planning, access to resources and technology, 
skills, and know-how, and it varies between communities and, and countries. In general, those with least adaptive capacity are the poor, those reliant on climate-affected livelihoods, those who are already socially vulnerable and at risk, and those coping, uh, whose coping strategies are exhausted. For this reason, a farmer here in the United States will be in a far better position to cope with changes in rainfall patterns than a farmer in the Sahel. People living in the Sahel are already food insecure due to variable landfall and high growing season temperatures, as well as issues related to governance and rising food prices. As temperatures rise due to climate change, the growing season will be further constricted and the population will become more vulnerable to poverty and hunger related deaths ultimately driving people out of agriculture and out of the region. These displaced people turn into what are known as climate migrants, and as their numbers grow, we will need to find new places for them to live. I'm very aware of the acute impacts on vulnerable populations because when I was president of Ireland, I was asked by the Irish aid agencies in 1992 to go to Somalia to draw attention to the famine there caused by a conflict between warlords. I was actually able to talk to the warlords and try to get the food through to the feeding stations. Last summer, in July, I was asked by the same Irish aid agencies to go back to Somalia because the situation was dire there. In fact, while we were there in July, famine was declared. And the one thing that was different in the 19 years, most factors were worse, but the one thing that I hadn't been conscious of in 1992 was the climate factor. The Horn of Africa has had the eight hottest years on record ever in succession. So of course it's going to be worse in the coming years, apart from all the other problems. A recent CGIAR study looking at temperatures and precipitation up to 2050 from global climate models for a broad belt, belt of the Earth between 35 degrees south and 45 degrees north found that the length of the growing season shifts to less than 120 days in a number of locations across the tropics, including Mexico, northeast Brazil, southern and west Africa, and India. This is a critical threshold for a number of stable crops, as well as rangeland vegetation. Secondly, reliable crop growing days decrease to critical levels below which cropping might become too risky to pursue as a ma major livelihood strategy in a large number of places across the global tropics including West Africa, East Africa, and India. Thirdly, high temperature stress above 30 degrees centigrade will be widespread in East and Southern Africa, North and South India, Southeast Asia, Northern Latin America, and Central America. And fourthly, changes in rainfall quanti quantity and quality are expected, which are likely to make rain-fed agriculture more risky in many parts of the tropics. While there is some evidence that mid to high latitude regions of the world will benefit from lengthened growing seasons in the short term, it's unlikely that sufficient food could be imported from temperature zone countries to balance the food deficit of the tropics. This is because the expected decline in agricultural GDP, coupled with the continuing rise in global food prices, will simply make commercial purchases of cereals on world markets unaffordable for many of the poorest countries. So while some parts of the world could potentially grow more food, the parts of the world that need it are unlikely to be able to afford it. So what becomes clear is that those parts of the world that are most exposed to climate impacts tend to have the lowest adaptive capacity and are therefore most vulnerable. This points to the acute need to adapt to the impacts of climate change and to prioritize those parts of the world that are most vulnerable for our immediate attention. And it equally points to the need to reduce the emissions that are causing the problem, which takes me to my next theme, what might be called the geography of responsibility. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is founded on an understanding that some countries are more responsible than others for the cause of the problem. There's no doubt that the industrialized countries of the world are responsible for the bulk of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Development in those countries has been based on the intensive use of fossil fuels and remains highly reliant on those resources to this day. On the other hand, most developing countries have yet to reap the benefits of this model of economic growth and as a result have contributed less to the problem. This understanding, as you know, led to the creation of annexes to the convention, which determine that countries are essentially developed or developing. 
Annex 1 or non-Annex 1. Within the Annex 1 countries, there is an Annex 2 category, which is essentially made up of OECD countries, and this group has obligations to provide financial and technical support to developing countries to assist them to address climate change. In this way, back in 1992, when the Convention was created, the lines were drawn for different levels of responsibility for both the causes of the problem and the requirement to act. In order to bring equity into the process, these differences were enshrined in the Convention under the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. In accordance with this principle, those who've contributed most to the problem, in this case developed countries, should act first to reduce emissions. The principle also recognizes difference in capacity to address the problem. Those countries that are richer tend to have more skills, technology, and resources with which to control emissions and are committed under the Convention to supporting those countries with less capacity to adapt to the impacts of climate change. This vital basic principle gives us a pathway by which sustainable development can be delivered by recognizing that there are different levels of responsibility and at the same time different obligations for financial assistance and technology transfer. The responsibility to assist developing countries to adapt to and mitigate climate change is the second part of the principle. Collectively, developed countries, as you'll recall, have committed to providing 100 billion US dollars per year in support for developing countries by 2020 and to improve access to the technologies that will enable the transition to low carbon green growth. Delivering on these commitments is as important as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It helps to recast climate change as a shared challenge requiring a collective, although differentiated, response. And in Durban, we got the commitment to the Green Climate Fund, but we still haven't found how we're going to find that 100 billion a year. Of course, some emerging developing countries, collectively called the Basic Group, and comprised of Brazil, South Africa, India, and China, are now starting to have significant emissions. And this is at the core of disagreements about how to act as an international community to avoid dangerous climate change. China is now the world's largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for some 25% of the global total, while the United States, in second place, accounts for 18% of global emissions. However, the Chinese per capita average is only five tons per person, which is some way behind the United States at almost 17 tons per person. Historically, however, the contribution to the total stock of global greenhouse gas emissions by emerging economies such as China and India has been significantly lower than the United States or the European Union. This dichotomy between countries with a historic responsibility and countries which are predominantly responsible for current or future emissions has created an intractable Gordian knot in climate negotiations. Major actors are unwilling to stand down from deeply entrenched positions and rapidly developing economies argue in favor of their right to development. It leads to questions about the extent to which the annexes created in 1992, which continue to define countries as developed or developing to be applicable today. In addition, it raises the conundrum of how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale while respecting the right to development of those nations that have not yet attained their development goals. It demands an in-depth evaluation of what we mean by equity in terms of global development. How can we source the energy needed to feed the world's population, power industrial growth, and improve standards of well-being while redressing the injustices and inequities of our current system of trade, consumption, and production? I was in India about 10 days ago. I have to admit, I have a very bad carbon footprint. I <laughs> travel far too much. but. Um, I was in India with the Elders, which is a group that Nelson Mandela has brought together that I'm honored to be part of. Our chair who was with us is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. We also had Guru Brundtland, who authored the Brundtland Report 25 years ago, and Ila Bhatt, a wonderful Indian woman who founded the Self-Employed Women's Association. We were tackling child marriage. So we went to Bihar, one of the poorest states, where there's high prevalence of child marriage, but also high prevalence of poverty. And it brought home to me that although India has rich parts and has developed quite a lot and has um, made a lot of progress in various areas, it also has a huge poor population without electricity, without access um, to, as yet, um, their right 
to development. This gets us into the third area I'd like to explore, the geography of politics and power, geopolitics. Clearly, arguing over who goes first, who acts when, and by how much is at the core of the climate change negotiations. Until we move beyond this debate to decide that we all need to act to reduce risk and to reduce emissions, we won't make progress. We're getting closer to this realization, but there's some way to go, and I'd like to sketch out where the latest round of climate negotiations at COP17 in Durban leaves us in relation to this objective. At the crux of the Durban negotiations was the need to decide what should happen after the end of the first phase of the Kyoto Protocol at the end of 2012, this year. Since, since 2007, work has been ongoing to design a new agreement for the post-2012 period, with the aim of keeping global warming to less than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. There's been disagreement as to whether this should continue to be a top-down, international, legally binding agreement, or whether the objective of reducing emissions could better be achieved through voluntary commitments by countries, a sort of bottom-up. From a climate justice perspective, we in my foundation have argued for a legally binding international agreement as the only way to hold countries to account and to ensure that actions are taken to protect the most vulnerable. Without a legally binding agreement, there's no obligation to act. Without a global agreement that includes all countries, there's a risk that the voices of the most vulnerable will not be heard and that the biggest polluters won't do their fair share. Durban delivered a commitment to develop, and I quote, a new protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force by 2015, which would come into force by 2020. Now, there are two ways to read this. One is that this risks nothing meaningful being done to cut emissions until 2020, and that would be far too late. Or the more optimistic view, which I tend to share, that we now have all countries of the world including major polluters like the United States, who didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol, committed to working together as part of a multilateral process to develop a new legal agreement. There's wriggle room for those countries who are reluctant to sign up to a legally binding agreement in the terms of an agreed outcome with legal force. However, the majority of countries are committed to a legally binding instrument, and this, I believe, is significant. Lots of work will need to be done, technical, legal, and diplomatic, to achieve the 2015 deadline. It's only four years. Four years to agree on many issues which divide us, and many of which are core climate justice issues, such as equity, the right to development, and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Meanwhile, of course, the voluntary commitments made to reduce emissions in Cancun at COP16 in 2010 need to be implemented and increased. It's expected that the fifth assessment report of the International, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and the outcomes of the 2013 to, 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 to 2013 to 2015 review of the global goal to keep warming below two degrees Celsius will provide additional evidence and impetus to set emissions reductions targets at a level which will safeguard us all from dangerous climate change. As part of this effort, we will need to start looking at action on climate change, not as a threat to our economies and way of life, but as an opportunity for a better, more sustainable quality of life. And of course, you as geographers, cognizant of the interconnectedness of our planetary ecosystems and peoples, are well placed to champion this approach. The door is now open for a new international and inclusive legally binding agreement to solve the climate change problem. We have a start date last month, January 2012, and a deadline, December 2015, and a lot of work to do, barriers to break down, and agreement to reach before then. Central to this will be overcoming the divide between developed and developing countries in the climate negotiations. The alliance formed in Durban between the European Union, the least developed countries, and the small island developing states started to challenge this divide. It was a very significant factor in getting the agreement at the end of Durban, because by the Un European Union aligning itself with the least developed countries and the small island states, you had a bulk of states, about 120 states, saying, we want a legal agreement. And South Africa, the host country, said, yes, we have to go along with that. And then Brazil said, yes, we have to. And China and India 
and eventually, I have to say, this country, the United States, um, agreed um, to, uh, the, uh, to, to the decision. Um, it's a move in the right direction that will need to be nurtured and strengthened in the coming years to facilitate an ambitious new agreement. We also need to keep up the pressure and increase the sense of urgency so that by 2015, parties are ready to take ambitious commitments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. To accompany this, we'll need transparent and effective ways of ensuring equity related to the pace and scale of emissions reductions, with those most responsible taking the lead. This is a key concern of developing countries who have yet to reap the benefits of fossil fuel powered growth and who fear having their development opportunities quashed by limits on their greenhouse gas emissions. These are core climate justice issues and my foundation will be working to mobilize world leaders, thinkers and those with influence to address these issues and find common ground. I welcomed the outcome in Durban because it marked progress and set a deadline for the delivery of a new climate agreement. It was not the breakthrough needed to solve the problem now, but no one really expected that. Neither was it a failure. In fact, it lays down a clear challenge to all the countries of the world, and particularly those responsible for the worst emissions, to get their act together before it's too late. A new roadmap has been set for seriously addressing climate change, and we should all play our part in putting pressure on the world's leaders to take on their responsibilities. In Durban, those who are willing to act on climate change, the EU, the small island states, and the least developed states, set themselves apart from those who refused that collective action, refuted that collective action as needed. Unfortunately, the United States, Canada, and some of the basic countries continue to drag their feet, and there's a real risk that despite the Durban commitment, they will hinder progress. And that's where I believe that you come in. You're here in large numbers. I'm very impressed by the size of your gathering and the fact that you have a lot of, a lot of international geographers also here. You understand how our planet works, how we are all interconnected, and how finite resources actually are. You occupy in many ways the crucial space between our understanding of the natural world, how it affects human life, and how human activity continues to shape that world. You're very well placed to take a climate justice and human-centered approach to the issue of climate change. So I want to challenge you to speak up for the people living at risk from the impacts of climate change in cities, on small farms, on desert plains, and along low-lying coasts. I want you to use geography to explain why people in different places experience differing levels of risk and why people are responsible to differing degrees for the problem and for finding solutions. This can set the stage for a discussion about what is right and wrong and why we are morally obliged to act. Only in this way can we enable the citizens of the world to demand more of their leaders to protect them, not just now in the face of economic uncertainty, but also in the longer term and in the interests of a safe world for their children and grandchildren. We're balanced on a knife edge between the possibility of avoiding dangerous climate change or committing ourselves to irreversible and catastrophic levels of warming. We have a small window of time in which to motivate the leaders of the world to act. So I urge you to use your individual and your collective powers of research, argument, teaching, and advocacy to send a strong message that people are at risk and that people must solve the problem. You can do this by championing a climate justice approach. So I was very honored when I received the communication that you were going to give me um, the second Atlas Award following somebody that I admire greatly, Jane. Um, and um, I felt that it was an opportunity to challenge an audience that can make a difference. So over to you, make a difference. Thank you.